Good morning, brothers and sisters. Um, <clears throat> this morning, I'm going to do a first part of a two-part presentation about Gabriel the angel. And um, it's very important for us to understand this, um, what, what this represents. And I'm just going to go through a lot of points and, and build and uh, come to a conclusion. Um, <clears throat> but before we start, let's begin with a word of prayer. Okay, um, so just so we understand what's been represented here, here is our binding off. Um, this is the structure that was given by the other lines and it's based upon the, the parable of the ten virgins and the two temple cleansings. And we've been doing a lot on these two temple cleansings, showing how that it's a work that begins here and it comes to a completion here. Although it is two temple cleansings, it's marking a point where there's a group separated here and then final group separated here. And it's also marked by two births. Okay, there's a, there's a birth here that marks the beginning of the work, but it's not perfected there. And the perfection comes at this second birth and this represents the new birth experience. So you've got to have the new birth experience at the beginning and at the end, and this is Prophetically speaking, this will literally happen, but um, it's, it's been placed on a prophetic model that a group of people need to, to go through this uh, in order to be saved. And <clears throat> so we also understand that these two temple cleansings of these two births are brought around about by this, uh, the, the fulfillment of the angel of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 here. And the angel of Revelation 18, 4 and 5 here. These two voices, these two calls that parallel these two temple cleansings. And uh, we're just going to look at the, the same sort of truth now, but from a different angle. And um, this is why we're looking at the angel Gabriel. And although we're not going to talk much about Gabriel uh, in this first presentation, you'll see why it's necessary that we put these things in place. Let's begin now by... Going to Genesis chapter 15, <clears throat> and here is the promise given to Abram. In verse 1 it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy, uh, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now towards heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee uh, out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. So, there's a lot of principles there we have to see. Firstly, Abraham has been brought out of Babylon in order to inherit the land, right? And the, what's been promised to him here is... First of all, a seed, and that seed is rep referencing a birth. So I just want to put that in place that, that in, let, let's just make a, a note of that, that the seed that's been referenced here is equaling a birth. And that birth literally 
okay, was, was, was his son, right, Isaac, but Isaac was just typifying Christ because it says if you be, Abraham, if you be Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. And it says in Galatians, not unto seeds as of many, but of one which is Christ. So the, the, the promised seed was Christ, and it was typified by his son Isaac. But Christ is our example in all things, and he's typifying us at the end of the world. So the, the seed at the end of the world is God's people, and you can prove that from, from many aspects. But the seed is also the word of God, and it, the, 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 the promised seed are those that have the word of God in them. So... <clears throat> Abraham is saying, I, I've been given no seed. And the Lord's saying that the, the seed is going to come out of your bowels. And that's why it says, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So it's a promise to Abraham that his seed would, would number the, uh, the sand of the sea, or should I say the sand of the sea would not be able to number how, how many there will be. Um, let's jump to verse 18. And it says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. So whoever the seed is, which is representing a birth, is also promised the land. So the birth and the land go hand in hand. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And then it marks these ten nations, the Canaanites, the Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaims, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is representing the world. The ten nations represent the world. And God's inheritance, the people that are saved, uh, are going to inherit this, this world. And, and this is what it's a symbol of. And so... I just want to put that point in place that the promise is two things. It's a seed that's been promised the land, the seed being a birth. So, and we were putting in place before that there's two births that you have to go through. And it's this second birth here will inherit the land, right? So the birth, doing right here, will inherit the land. And we'll show that as we go through. Now, in Great Controversy 343, uh, paragraph 1, it says, The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity. In every great reformation or religious movement, the principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. So, I just want to remind us of this principle that God deals with man ever the same. Right? So, we how he deals with one is the same way he deals with another. And he's the pattern man. He does it in a set fashion through the everlasting gospel. So, in relation to these two births, I want to remind us, let's go to John chapter 3. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he's explaining this to Nicodemus, uh, who's a leader in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but he does not understand. And Nicodemus replies in a, in a literal fashion, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? So Nicodemus is thinking about two literal births, whereas Christ is talking about two spiritual births. And he explains it in verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So, I want to put this in place now, right? These two births, the first one is the water. The water birth equals flesh. But... The, the spirit birth equals spirit, right? That's maybe that's just too obvious, but it's important that we put that place. And <clears throat> so um, it's very important that, that, that we see these points. And we know that in Matthew chapter 3, John says, I baptize you with water. But one cometh after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, right? So these are these two births. 
uh, marked by the, the, the baptism and the, the second one being Pentecost. And we know that, that this right here is Pentecost. It's where the full outpouring of the Holy Spirit is given. But we also know that, and we've put this in place, that this is also typified by Pentecost. Um, this is Pentecost internally, this is Pentecost externally, right? And represented by Revelation 18, 1 to 3 and Revelation 18, 4 and 5. Okay, so <clears throat> we know that Christ, when he was baptized by the water, the Holy Spirit came down upon him, right? So you, you have this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we know that at Pentecost, the, the disciples were baptized by the Holy Spirit. So you, you can see the, the, this principle. But I want us to look further on in John chapter 3, because in verse 14 he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Christ is trying to explain to um, Nicodemus that the, the born-again experience is pointing to the cross as, as well as pointing to Pentecost, right? Now we also know that, that this is marking the cross, marking the point where he says it, it, it is done, right? So you, bo you have both the cross and Pentecost at the end of the world here marking this same point because it's been brought together line upon line. So, um, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have uh, eternal life. So, I just need us to see that, that, that uh, principle right there, that this second birth is in fact the, 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 the cross experience, right? And um, <clears throat> that's, what, um, that's what Christ is trying to, to teach Nicodemus. Christ had already had the first baptism by the water, right? And now he was pointing forward to this, this second one that his people needed to have. They needed to have this baptism of the Spirit. But he's also pointing forward to the, the cross because this is the experience that's going to lead to the baptism of the, the Spirit, okay? So the birth is the baptism of the Spirit. That's what it is, and we have to have it twice. And it's represented by Revelation 18, 1 to 3, first temple cleansing, and Revelation 18, 4 and 5. You can't, you can't just have it once, you have to have both. Now, we'll see this principle here from a different angle. From 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 35, it says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. So here is talking about sowing something, and except uh, it, whatever is sown cannot be quickened unless it die. So let's read on. It says, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. So it's likening whatever's been sown here to a, a body, and it's paralleling it with grain, right? But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Now, you can go to, uh, let's go to, to Matthew chapter 13, just Put this point in place. Um, Matthew 13. Um, excuse me. In verse 38 it says, The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked ones. So the seed are likened unto God's people. So and it says here in verse 1 Corinthians 15, 38, But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Right? All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. 
But the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Okay, so a terrestrial body is an earthly body and a celestial body is a heavenly body. And it, and it explains this. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. Right? So it's talking here about a seed which represents a body, right? And there's two bodies being represented, uh, terrestrial and a celestial. Um, excuse me. Okay, terrestrial and celestial, and they're likened to a seed. Um, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. So I want to make this point here that this body, when it's sown, the earthly body is sown in corruption. But it's raised up, the celestial body is raised up in in corruption. And th this will explain itself as we go down through this. It is so, sown in dishonor, is raised up in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. So you have all these things here, um, dishonor and weakness. And this is, is raised in um, glory and power. Okay, so there's a lot of nice things being, being marked here. But it's all to do with the sowing of this seed, which is a body, right? <coughs> and we'll see that the, the seed has to be sown and it's sown in corruption and it's raised in incorruption. It's got these two phases to it, just like the birth. There's two births, right? And you see it also with this, and we, we, we will show this as we, we go through. And it goes on to say, in verse 44, it is sown in a natural body, it is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So let's just write on here as well. So natural, spiritual. Okay, and remember that <coughs> Christ was saying to Nicodemus, unless a man be born of the water and the spirit, and then he likens the water baptism to the flesh, which is the natural man, and the second one to the spirit, and it's Marking here, the natural and the spiritual, the flesh and the spirit, the water and the spirit. Okay, v very important that we see that. And just to bring a, a point in here, in Matthew 13, verse 24, it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, we're just talking about here the seed represent this body is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. So the sowing time is marking this natural body because it's given a body. Um, so the parable of the sower in verse 25 says, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat. So <clears throat> what we have to understand is that the sowing time Okay, the, 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 the sowing time is being marked by uh, th this point right here because in Millerite history this was parallel by April 19th. 
and it marks the tarrying time. And in the parable of Matthew 25, it says, um, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. So it's marking the point where they're sleeping. It says, while men slept, the, um, <coughs> while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat. Right? So as Christ sows, Satan counterfeits it. So we know that this right here is a message. Revelation 81 to 3. The message is being confirmed. It's been placed in the hearts right here. So the, 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 the sowing time here, but while the, the good seed has been sown, also the devil is sowing his tares, right? And we know that Satan comes down right here to test God's people with a false message. You have to be able to discern between good and evil. So there's a true message and a false message, both being and manifested at the same time. It's this parable of the wheat and the tares. And, and it's this test, this sowing of this corrupt body, this first birth, leading to this uh, incorruption, this celestial body, which is this second birth. And, and we need to understand that. So back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So when we take those two things and um, <clears throat> so the, the, the first one, we can just write it on here now, Adam. It says, was made, um, excuse me, the first Adam was made a living soul. Um, and the last Adam, which was Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Okay, so you have these, these two buffs. First comes the natural, followed by the spiritual. And this is what it's teaching us here. Because it says, Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward that which is spiritual. The first man of the earth is earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So Adam is a living soul and he is earthy. Whereas Christ is heavenly. <coughs> now, Let's go to John chapter 12, because I want just to see a point here, because in 1 Corinthians 15, which we were reading, it was talking about this seed. And in verse 36, it says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. Right? So it talks about this seed having to die in order to be quickened. And the quickening is by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we go to um, John chapter 12, in verse 19, it says, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail, nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. It's at this point now where the, the, the Jews, this is at the end of Christ's ministry, realize that everybody's going after Christ. And... And it says in verse 20, And there were certain Greeks, this is the Gentiles, among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. 
Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Right? So you're raised in a, a glorified body. So Christ was going to be glorified when he went to the cross. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So Christ had to go to the cross to die, right? So let's write here, except the seed die right it cannot be quickened it has to die to bring forth much fruit okay and it's talking about the the cross and it goes on in verse 25 he that loveth his life shall lose it and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal if any man serve me let him follow me and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honour. So, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it, it will not bring forth much fruit. So, and it's, it's telling you that if you love your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life, for Christ's sake, you will have eternal life. And he says, follow me. So in Matthew 16 and verse 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So we have to follow Christ to the cross to die in order to bring forth much fruit. It says no cross, no crown. Right? And in John chapter 2, um, it's not John, Job chapter 2, excuse me. Job chapter 2 verse 3 says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without a cause. So we understand this, we've put this in place. Job gets tested right here. Satan comes down. And he says that the earth is mine. I've been walking up and down in it. And the Lord says, hast thou seen my servant Job? And Job gets tested now by all his worldly cares and belongings. His family, friends, and, and everything that he owns gets taken from him. And he gets tested and he passes the test. But now it's a test upon his life. Okay, And this is what Satan is saying. Uh, because in verse 4 he says, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Yes, yeah, skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath, he will give for his life. Okay? So Christ said, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in his world shall keep it. So Job is now having this second test, and it's a test for his life. He says, But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So we know that although it looks like you're going to die, the Lord has promised that he will deliver you. Right? So <clears throat> the point is that um, this is this, this test. The cry at midnight will see when there's any real faith in the promises of God when you come face to face with death. Right? This is where you, do you really believe in Christ? For it says, whosoever believeth on me shall not perish, but have eternal life. So you're going to be tested. With, do you really believe the promise? Do you really believe the promise given to Abraham that the Lord is going to bring forth this birth right here? And the birth marks the point where you inherit the land. And remember the chasm, when you look over the chasm, you saw the promised land over the other side of the chasm. And we, we spoke about this, that in uh, Luke chapter 16, the parable about Lazarus and the rich man, and Lazarus uh, was, was dead, he was in Abraham's bosom, he had received the promise. 
okay, and, and the, the rich man was looking across this gulf that he could not cross. And the gulf, the word gulf there means the chasm. And he was not able to, to cross it anymore, right? So this great gulf was fixed and Lazarus represented the one that was raised out of his grave because Christ raised him out of his grave. And in that parable, it said, though, though one were raised from the grave to, to tell his brothers, he says they would not believe if they don't believe the, the law and the prophets. And Christ was, was predicting something because Lazarus was raised out of his grave, representing this time period here, and they didn't believe. So he was already telling them that they would put to death Lazarus, even though he was raised from the dead. So it's all about this, this birth. And this birth was the same birth that, that how Christ was raised up, right? Because he went to the cross and then he was to be raised up again, right? Mark in these, these three days, the death, the Sabbath, and the, the resurrection, right? M many symbols represent this principle right here. This is why Christ was saying, right, that a man had to be born again. It wasn't, wasn't sufficient to have this water baptism at the beginning, but you had to have this uh, cross experience at the end, where the, the seed would fall into the ground and die in order to be quickened. <clears throat> so, let's look at something uh, different now to, to, to bring in on this. If we go to Exodus chapter 16, now Exodus 16 is marking the point where they've come out of Egypt and they're now being tested, right? And in verse 4 it says, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So we know that prophetically speaking, um, this, this point here, point A, marks the end of the third step and the beginning of the, the, the ne next fractal. So we know that this was, was Passover, okay, in Christ's line. It's also Passover in Moses' line. It was October 22nd in the Millerite line, okay, and it would be midnight uh, in, in our line. And then this, this new, new fractal starts. So it marks the point where, in some sense, they, they come out of Egypt. But once they came out of Egypt, it's like a whole new beginning for them, right? And they're brought into this test. So when they come out of Egypt on Passover, they're brought into the wilderness after three days uh, travel. They're brought into the wilderness. And <coughs> 50 days later from that point, they, they come down to Pentecost, right? But after the cross, Christ is three days in the grave and he comes out of the grave, right? So you've got the end by the beginning, comes out of the grave and he comes back to them for 40 days and he breathes on them, right? And the breath is likened unto the, the, the manna. So you have this manna test here. And the Lord is going to, to, to prove them, right? It's, it's a test. And what he's, what he's explaining is that he's going to give them for one, two, three, four, five days they were to gather manna. But on the sixth day they were to gather double, right? So let's just put the sixth day here. And Revelation 18, 1 to 3 says, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. You have this double uh, marked right there. And we'll confirm that with another line at the moment. And, but the, the seventh day, let, let's read on. Um, in verse 22, And it came to pass that on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for one man, and all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said, Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath. And the Lord, <coughs> unto the Lord, Bake that which you will bake today, and seeth that which you will seeth, 
and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. So the sixth day they were to get double and then the seventh day was the, the Sabbath which was the rest. Okay, important for us to understand. So let's look at the rest. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. So those that believe, it says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have eternal life. And the rest is marking this eternal life. It's, or it's been typified by this experience that they were to enter into in the wilderness. Uh, <clears throat> For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So he's taking you back now to Genesis, to this seven days where uh, man was created, right? And it's been paralleled here by this man test. Five days they were to gather, the sixth day double, and the seventh day they were to rest. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So there's a real important thing there. Those that, to whom it was first preached, many who first hear the message are, are not going to enter in because of unbelief. So... The rest, we have to understand what this rest is. Now, I understand that the rest was when they entered into the, uh, the promised land in, in type. It was the, it's the, when they entered into the land of Canaan, it was typifying them entering into this heavenly rest for, for, for eternity. And um, we know that it was only Joshua and Caleb, out of all the original people that, that left Egypt's only Joshua and Caleb that, that entered in. There was many others, but they were children that were born in the wilderness. All the rest had died because of unbelief, and there was like roughly two million people that left. So <laughs> the, the ratio was pretty extreme. Um, now, so let's understand this rest. From early writings 31, uh, paragraph 2, it says... <coughs> And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. So, in this paragraph here, it's talking about Revelation 14, 14 through 17, and it, it, it's marking this uh, harvest where Christ comes on the cloud to, to harvest the souls. In the very next paragraph is one line that says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And it's parallel in this harvest to the, the rest. And we know that the harvest is right here. Okay? So, uh, and she goes on, and now she jumps to the New Jerusalem. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21.2. And we know that Christ says, tarry, right? And that October 22nd, 1844, was typifying point C. This is the perfect fulfillment of October 22nd, when the, the door is going to shut of the parable of the ten virgins, marking the second coming of Christ. For this group, right, is the latter reign. And it's marking here, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the marriage, those that enter in. Um, and I looked, and loyal lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in the forehead. 
And they got the seal of God. So I want to mark here the 144,000. And that's important. And this is part of what this study is about. Because the 144,000 will not die. Okay, they, they've passed the test, they have the seal, and they do not die, right? So it's important to, to understand the, the, this illustration. So I'll just put that in place there, and then we'll come back to that as we go through. Next paragraph, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. So it marks this point, there's no more curse. You've got the two trees either side of the river marking the two witnesses. Okay? These are a parallel to the two witnesses. And this is important because we're going to see this. And the throne is over the river and the, out of the, 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 the river comes this crystal clear water. And there's no more curse. And Christ says, uh, uh, he, in, in John chapter 9, I think it is, he says, All those that come unto me, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And on the cross... Christ was pierced in his side and out of his belly came the water and the blood, right? This water gushed out of his belly, marking this point. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And the life is in the blood. So you have this water and blood both marking the, 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 the word of God that, that's, that saves us if we receive it right here, how it was being poured out. <clears throat> and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads so it's marking this, this group 144,000 that have no more curse that uh, they're now receiving of this heavenly blessing okay um, now, we, we mentioned that this was like an anti-creation week, so let's go to creation week because we need to see something. In Genesis 1, in verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So man was created on the sixth day. Right? I didn't read the, the first five days, it's Mark and all the other things that he was creating, but man is creating the sixth day, so we're paralleling man being made here. And we were looking at this in 1 Corinthians 15, these, these two bodies, the terrestrial and the celestial, sown in corruption, uh, raised in incorruption, dishonor, glory, weakness, power, the natural and the spiritual. First comes the natural. The natural was Adam, who was made a living soul. And here, you've got the man being made on the sixth day, parallel to Adam, who was earthy, right? Now, why is that important? Well, because in Genesis 2 verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, right? So, <clears throat> now I, I, I want, want us to, to, to understand this, that um, there's two parts be, being done here, right? 
Now, we have Adam marked here as a living soul, but the Lord makes Adam on the sixth day, but it's, it's at the seventh day, once he's completed, that he places him in the land. And there's two paths, right? It says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So the first part is the forming, and the second part is the breathing his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So, in one analogy, you've got Adam here is Matt, the f first man, he's earthy because Adam's made of the dust of the ground, right? Uh, so you've got Adam here, but now it's likening the first Adam to the second Adam. But in this illustration, it's showing you this, this making of Adam in two parts. The first part is the, the making of him, the, uh, um, God formed man of the dust of the ground, and the second part is he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And I want to show that the forming of Adam was here, but the breathing in was here. And this is the, the spirit. And, and, and I want us to see that. Um, in verse 8 it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So as soon as he's formed and he breathes into him, the immediate thing that happens, he's placed into the land. And this is the promise, the birth, they inherit the land. And when Adam was breathed into, he, he came to life. As soon as he came to life, the Lord puts him into the land. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that he had rested from all his work which he had created and made. So this is a process of seven days, and when he gets down to the end of the sixth day, he's now finished it, right? And he rests on the seventh day because it marks the point where the man enters into the land. He inherits the promise. And I, I need us to understand that. And it says that he blesses this day, right? Uh, and he says that thus, it says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, right? It was finished. Now, if we look at John chapter 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost, right? So <clears throat> it marks the point where Christ dies. It says, lest a man die, okay, he, he the seed cannot be quickened unless the seed dies. So it marks this, this death where he says it's finished and it's marking the point where he's really, uh, it's really fulfilling the promise he's going to be brought back to life. So <clears throat> um, the cross is marking a death and, and, and resurrection. Okay. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. It says, Blessed is he that waiteth, or tarries. Blessed is he that tarries, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. So, blessed is the man that tarries, and comes to the thirteen thirty-five. But go thou thy way, Daniel, till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. So, um, so Daniel was to go till the end be, and then at the end, which was on, on for this, in this sake, the, the 1335 was the blessing that was pronounced on October 22nd, 1844. And the perfect fulfillment of that is right here, the blessing. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1335. And it's marking where Daniel stands up in his grave. He's been sleeping. He stands up, right, and uh, he's going to rest right there at the 
end of days. He's now going to uh, speak, right? This was what is marked there because it says on this chart right here, excuse me, at the bottom, right at the bottom here, Daniel will stand in his lot, and it's got in brackets, the resurrection at the end of days. And this is what we're talking about. This, this new birth is the resurrection. It's marking the resurrection of Christ, the resurrection of Lazarus, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we can see how all these things, uh, when they're brought together. Okay, now we want to go and look at the two witnesses. Okay, um, let's go to Revelation 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, and Sister White says, are finishing their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So there's a lot of points there. But the first point is that it's marking this 1260, okay, this time of persecution, or the 42 months, where the two witnesses were going to prophesy. And the two witnesses, uh, anciently speaking, was the, the, the Old and the New Testaments in the, in the time period of the persecution, in the, in the time period of the French Revolution. But it's representing, in a, in a spiritual aspect, the Law and the Prophets, or Moses and Elijah. And Moses is the one that you know, brought all the plagues down. Elijah is the one that, that uh, um, it, it basically said there, um, verse 6, These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. In the days of Elijah, it rained not for, for 1260, right? For, for these three and a half years. So you can see that, it, that in a spiritual sense, it's talking about Moses and Elijah, these two prophets. And near the end of their prophesying, there's a period that b just before they get to the end, there is a, a beast that rises up and to make war against them and, and puts them to death. And we understand it's right here, this this death decree rises up right here, and this three and a half is like a little fractal of 1260. This is the, the cross, because it says where our Lord was crucified. This here is just a fractal of this here. This is also the cross, where he first goes on the cross. So you've got the, this last week of Christ in miniature here, in, uh, in representation to this big one, and we, we've already laid that out. Um, and they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So this three and a half days, which is three and a half years, is 1260, marking this period of persecution where God's people are, uh, are being put to death and um, 
<clears throat> at the end of the period, right, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. So you have this here. First, the, the, the first is the, 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 the water baptism, which is flesh. The second one is the spirit baptism, which is a baptism of the spirit. Christ, the first man, Adam, made a living soul. The second man, Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Unless the seed fall into the ground, it cannot be quickened, right? The first man is earthy, the second man is heavenly. And except the seed die, right, it can't receive the blessing, right? So, <clears throat> After three days and a half, the spirit of life of God entered into them and they stood upon their feet. Daniel stands in his lot under the blessing of the 1335. It's the, it's the latter rain. And, and the latter rain is the books of Daniel and Revelation are now opened, right? And God's people have a full understanding of them and they give this message to the world. Okay. Um, and the Lord says to them, Come up hither. Okay, that's that's important. That's we need to see that for later. And it also says that great fear falls upon their enemies. So the the, the, the nations have a, a great fear falls upon them right there. And now we also know that. Um, this is the shaking of the earth, shaking of the heaven and the earth. And it says the shaking of the heaven and the earth, it's uh, God's people will be delivered by the voice of God. And it said there, they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. So there's a voice from heaven delivers them, calling them up hither. And the, the enemies beheld them. Okay, so now let's go to Ezekiel 37. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about and behold there were many, very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones Unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I, the Lord, that, that I am the Lord. So, first of all, you've got this point where the prophet is taken by the Lord, and he shows him the state of uh, mankind. And the prophet has shown their terrible condition. There's this valley of dead, dry bones. And, and he asked the question, can these live? Right? Or should say, the Lord asked them the question, can these live? And he says, oh, only you know that, Lord. So the Lord then tells him what he's going to do. He tells them that I want you to prophesy. And when you prophesy, two things are going to happen. The first thing is that the bone is going to come together, bone to his bone, and the flesh is going to cover them. And the second thing that's going to happen is that the breath is going to enter into them and they're going to stand upon their feet. So it's these two phases, and it's exactly the same as what we see in Eden. The Lord formed Adam from the ground, and then the second thing he did is he breathed into them. And this is a confirmation from what I was trying to show you from, uh, from, from Genesis, that right here on the sixth day the Lord makes man, but... It's once he breathes into him right here that he places him in the land, right? He can't, he can't place him in the land until he's been breathed on. And he can't be breathed on unless he dies, right? And Christ dies right here. This is where he receives the breath and gets placed in the land. Because it says in order to, to die, you have to be, uh, in order to be quickened, you have to die, right? So this is this dying process. The death takes place right here, and now the resurrection can be brought about. So when we continue reading, verse 37 and verse, uh, sorry, Ezekiel 37 and verse 7, it said, So I prophesied as I was commanded, 
and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. Now, Sister White spoke about the shaking of the heavens, so the shaking of the earth and the shaking of the heavens and the earth. So the shaking of the earth is here. So to be consistent with what has been shown in Eden, you've got man being made here on the sixth day, therefore it's talking about this point right here, where he prophesies the first time and there's a shaking, and you have the shaking of the earth, right? So, when he prophesies, there is a, a shaking takes place. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And verse 8, And when I beheld, lo, the sinews of the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon this land that they may live. So now there's a second prophecy, and this second prophecy comes from the four winds. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. So Daniel stands on his feet here. Yeah, the two witnesses stand on their feet when they're told, come up hither, right? They're, they're raised up right there. Daniel is raised up out of his grave. So you have this same thing here, the second prophecy, the breath comes into them and they lived because prior to the breath coming into them, they were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. And they stand upon their feet. So. It's just marking the same point. The breath comes into them, they stand upon their feet, and it's marked by the four winds. I'm just putting that there because that will be important for us to see later. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our past. So, First of all, the Lord tells him what he's going to do. Then he does it in these two stages. And now he's going to reiterate just what he's done. <clears throat> Verse 12. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. So right here, he's likening this when the Spirit comes into them to be raised out of their graves and brought into the land. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my Spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. So right there, when you're raised out of the grave, he puts the Spirit in you and puts you in the land. All those things are marking the same point in time. Uh, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. You shall know it, right? God's people will know that they've been raised out of their grave right there. They'll know that they've gone through this whole experience and they've had this second birth according to the prophecy. So let's close with this last quote and then we will conclude this in our next presentation. It is with, this is from Review and Herald, July 20th, 1886. It is with an earnest longing that I look forward to the time when the events of the day of Pentecost shall be repeated with even greater power than on that occasion. John says, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. Then, as at the Pentecostal season, the people will hear the truth spoken to them, every man in his own tongue. God can breathe new life into every soul that sincerely desires to serve him and can touch their lips with a live coal from off the altar. So right here, the breathing of new life into every soul is likened unto the touching of the lips from a live coal from off the altar. And we know that this is Isaiah 6 right here. Holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory and he purges him by touches a lip saying thy sin is purged right it's the blotting out of sin 
that takes place right here, and he's now filled with the Spirit. So that the breathing in is the touching of the, the lips. Thousands of voices will be imbued with the power to speak forth the wonderful truths of God's word. The stammering tongue will be unloosed and the timid will be made strong to bear courageous testimony to the truth. May the Lord help his people to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement and to maintain such a close connection with him that they may be partakers of the latter rain when it shall be poured out. So... <clears throat> Uh, uh, we will conclude this in the next presentation and we will see why all this is important and showing how these two phases of this body of corruption, this earthy body, is the first phase that has to bring you to this second phase, this, this incorrupted body where you're filled with glory and power, and it, it, it's spiritual. And I don't mean that this is not the, the glorified body that you get when Christ returns. This is just a, a, a type. But the corruption that's in us is the sin. And you're going to be raised without sin. Okay, And that's what it's referring to. These, these two phases that we are representing uh, right here. And I, and I pray that that is a blessing. And we will see it uh, more as we conclude with our next presentation. Let us close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your great blessings. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the simple way in which you teach us through fractals, through line upon line, through repeating history, through patterns. We praise you, Lord, as you bring the effect of every vision together at the end of the world and how you're teaching us through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that all of us out there, Lord, my brothers and sisters, would submit themselves to you like a little child, to be ready to be taught of thee, to have open ears and a heart of understanding, that they might be blessed and cleansed of all their unrighteousness. And I pray this for um, all of us, Lord, including myself, and I pray that you'll finish the work in us as you've promised to do. And I praise you, Lord, and we ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.